I guess since we are recording, I... Hi. Oh, hi. For, sorry, I didn't know he turned for on. For you YouTube people, sorry about that. I, was, I, I know the Twitch people haven't probably jumped on yet, but I figured that the... Forgot about the YouTube people, but... Uh, <laughs> So, I'm just saying, um, welcome. Yeah. Welcome to Burnt Out Studios. Welcome. Please visit burntoutstudios.com. We haven't really done anything on there in a while, but um, you know, we need to we need to start promoting this stuff, um, promoting ourselves. Um, I've uh, I've actually talked to uh, some people that actually watched the stream, and um, they actually watched. And, um, no, actually, a few people have. I'm really right. surprised at some of the numbers, you know. The, uh, a lot of people want to uh, hear me continue the story, so <laughs> that's kind of what we're doing today. Um, I mean, also, I, I kind of wanted to, uh, like I said, I, we, I wanted to start pr promoting ourselves a little bit more. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, we need to change the name of the channel that we're on, hopefully to Burnout Studios one of these days, and we need to make a link from burnoutstudios.com to our podcast, and uh, so yeah, there's there some yeah. things that we need to do. Yeah, I need to probably, what we need to do is we need to create a second channel, that way I can have a channel for my drawing, and then have a channel just for... Well, yeah, but I don't see why it would matter, um, because isn't Burnout Studios, I mean, that's as much yours as it is mine. Well, true. But I, well, I guess for the longest time I've been under Jam Spoon. Right. So. On DeviantArt. Right. DeviantArt, Instagram. Mm-hmm. So, I, I, my platform, I guess my platform's not that big to rebrand, I guess, but. Right. It just means rebranding. Rebranding is, you know, a good thing, I think. Um, but, you know, uh, hopefully if we uh, get a colorist or something like that, you know, we can, um, you know, uh, it'll all be under that umbrella of Burnout Studios. But anyway, um, apparently I left off, uh, I finished Chapter 3, and now I'm going into Chapter 4. Is uh, the audio recording well? I mean, I can see uh, the little yeah, bar. It looks like we're doing pretty good. Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, here we go. Um, chapter four, The Woods. Mikno walks to the door and holds it open as Jesse and Lucius walk through. They stand on the front porch of the treetop tailor shop, and Lucius looks down for the spiral earth staircase, but it is no longer there. How are we supposed to get down, Lucius asks, stepping back from the edge. Lucius, do you see that treehouse across the way over there? Jesse asks as she points to a treehouse that is so big it uses two trees to hold it up. That is where we, we're, we're going to eat, she says. Lucius feels a little calmer now listening to Jesse's voice until she says, We are going to fly from here to there. <laughs> What? Lucius retreats till he is pressed against the door of the tailor shop and violently shakes his head no. Jesse slowly approaches him. Lucius, I would never let anything happen to you. She says, gently holding his cheeks in her hands. I don't want you to be afraid. Please take my hand and listen to my voice. <laughs> Lucius shuts his eyes and oh holds God. tightly to Jesse's hands. She moves closely to him and begins to sing and begins to sing to him in Elven. The song is soothing, and Lucius feels relaxed. His mind floats away from his body, and he feels the need to fall asleep. A strong wind uh, begins blowing around him, slightly muffling Jesse's singing. His hair blows wildly around, and he can suddenly, and suddenly he can no longer feel the ground. His fear battles against Jesse's song. He's fully aware he's flying, but he still he still feels safe with Jesse. He closes his eyes tighter and grips her hand harder, concentrating on listening to the song. And when she finishes, he can feel the ground beneath his feet again. He opens his eyes, and the wind around him dies down. He watches as Mikno comes to a gentle landing in front of him, 
and you can see the treetop tailor shop in the distance. He smiles at Jezzy and releases her hand and falls and falls into her, giving her the strongest hug he can muster. Who are you drawing? I was trying to draw I'm trying to draw Jesse. Jesse. I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to do like a little like a I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Well hopefully it'll work out what I have in my mind. We'll see. So if it doesn't, we'll scrap it and try something else. Continuing on. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm afraid of high places, he says, muffled by Jesse's body. It's all right, Lucius. That is the way my mother used to fly with me. I used to be frightened when flying, Jesse explains as she gently strokes Lucius's head. Mikno steps forward. Shall we eat? He asks, wanting to end the uncomfortable moment. Lucius steps back from Jesse, fixing his windblown hair and trying to look dignified, and answers, yes. That sounds great. They turn and enter the Twin Tree Tavern, a building which used to be two separate buildings, but have now been joined together. The bar is located between the two main rooms, and the two side rooms are filled with tables and people. The rooms have giant windows with their shutters open, allowing for a wonderful view of the woods outside. Mikno leads the way to an open table, which has its tops, which has its top carved in the elven language. He takes his seat and begins reading the table carvings. What's good here? Lucius asks. Mikno looks up from the table and answers, Well, I've never been here. I was reading about what they have, he says, pointing at the carved table. I used to come here with my first life mate. We used to sit over by the windows, and I would stare into his eyes, Jesse declares in a dreamy, faraway voice. Life, mate? Do you mean husband? Lucius asks. Jesse snaps out of her flashback stupor and answers, Yes, it is like a husband and wife. No, it's different in many ways, Lucius Mikno declares, interrupting. Humans believe in mating or marriage for life, but elves believe that they have been given men have been given many lives. Therefore, they have several life mates. When we get married, we set the duration of the marriage at the time of the ceremony. True, but we can renew our vows and extend the duration. My mother and father stayed together for over two hundred years. Jesse retorts proudly. Your family stayed together because that is what royalty does. It is expected, McMillan announces. Your family was royalty, Lucius asks. Yes, my father was a duke, but many marriages didn't last long, even in a royal family, Jesse says, staring angrily at McMillan. I don't believe they stayed together for love. They stayed together because it would look bad in a political climate of the time, McMillan says. My parents are the ones who laid the foundation for relationship with other races. If it were not for them, Lucius wouldn't be here. They loved all creatures, and they loved each other. May I take your order? A female elven server asks in, an elven, in the elven language. You're just jealous of the fact I knew my parents and you didn't know yours, Jesse whispers under her breath. I know my parents better than you did. My parents were your were your parents, and they raised me as their own. But you wouldn't, but you wouldn't know that because you you were never home. Bingo says, leaning across the table table closer to Jesse. I traveled because my parents wanted me to see the world. They wanted me to understand how the world worked. Excuse me, the Elven server whispers politely. What? Bingo and Jesse both scream. The server steps backwards, stunned, regains her composure, and asks softly, May I take your order? Mikno and Jesse look at each other and smile. We're sorry to yell. What is your specials tonight? Jesse asks. The server reads the specials from a piece of parchment she is holding. We will have three of those, Mikno answers. The server retreats quickly towards the bar. Lucius waits for the server to walk away and then says, I guess I should have known you two were siblings. 
if you were speaking in Elvin, I, if you were, were speaking in Elvin, I still would have been able to, if you weren't, sorry, if you weren't speaking in Elvin, I still would have been able to tell. Mikno and Jizzy, Jazzy giggle at each other, and Mikno answers, I guess we do act like brother and sister. Lucius waits for Mikno and Jesse to stop laughing and then asks, If the elves and the other races once tried to live together, why aren't they together now? Mikno looks at Jesse and then back at Lucius and after a big sigh starts to explain. At one time all of the races lived, together, lived in different parts of the world, but over time they became aware of each other. At first there was a peaceful trading and friendship and then wars start, as they often do. Many wars came and went, and finally, some people stepped forward to talk of peace. Jesse's father was one of those people. A truce was decided, and there were several years of peace. All races shared their cultures with each other. The humans discovered a new religion, and that religion started spreading. The stories of their new Bible made no mention of other races and we discovered quickly that humans are threatened by anything that refutes their beliefs. The human culture was much larger than any other culture since they re reproduced so rapidly. With their superior numbers they, de they decided to force their beliefs on others. The religion spread quickly and all the other races were labeled evil. Wars began and the humans were clearly the strongest of the races, just by their sheer numbers. The elders and the king decided that a war of this size couldn't be won even with the use of magic. The king ordered that a suitable hiding place be found. That is why we live in an underground forest. We are able to hollow out a mountain with the help of magic, and here we will stay till the day we can convince all the humans that we are not a danger to them. Not all humans are violent toward, Lucius begins to speak, but is cut short by Mikno. Some of us elves, Jesse and I, are working toward the goal of reuniting the races and abolishing all the ignorance in the world. And believe, and believe it or not, you are one of the important tools we are using. We will teach you the beauty of our culture and race, and you will be able to share that with the human world. Over time, we will be able to live together in harmony, Mikno explains. Lucius looks around the war room worried. I'm not going to be very popular here, am I? He asks. You will always be welcome to us, Jesse says with a smile and then continues. We are going to protect you and teach you to protect yourself. If you're too afraid, we can always return you to your world, Mikno says, holding Lucius' shoulder. Lucius feels free for the first time in his life and already thinks of Mikno and Jesse as parents. No, I'm ready to start a new life here, he says bravely. The server arrives with food, and as they eat, Jessie tells stories about where she visited when she was young. Her father sent her to many different countries so she, would, so she would be able to talk to anyone from any race or culture. She learned to hide her ears under her hair, and she would wear face paint to hide her elven color. She traveled around for 50 years. After the meal, after the meal they leave the tavern and Lucius holds tightly to Jesse as they fly back to the treetop tailor shop. This time he peeks a little while flying through the treetops. The clothing is finished and ready when they arrive. Lucius is pleased to have new clothing and shoes. He changes into his new clothes and places his other in his cloth sack the tailor let him keep. Mikno flies down to the horses first and is soon followed by Jesse, who is holding on to Lucius. They untie and mount their horses. They travel for a few more hours and rarely see the sun through the thick forest roof, but can tell it is getting darker. Mikno stops his horse and announces, 
I believe it is time to set up camp. Hmm. Jesse and Mikno jump from their horses, and Lucius pauses to ask, I thought the woods were too dangerous to stay in at night. That is true. They are dangerous for people traveling alone, but we are three. We should be safe. Mikno answers as he unties his bag from his horse. Lucius slowly slides off his horse. You don't sound so sure about that, he says, looking at Mikno. I assure you, we will be fine. I have personally stayed in this part of the woods, Mikno says to reassure Lucius. And in truth, he has stayed in the woods quite a few times, but he was unsure how the creatures of the woods would react to the new human boy. I will make a fire. You two set up shelter. Jesse says, carrying her bag over a, to a, over near a tree. Now that your heart's jumped out of your <laughs> chest. I wonder if the, uh, I'm sure the microphone had to pick that up. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> sorry. Okay, I will make a fire. You two shut up shelter, Jesse says, carrying a bag over near a tree. She walks into the woods, out of sight of, from, out of sight from Lucius, but Mikno can still see her even as the darkness floods around them. You can still see her, can't you? Lucius asks, staring at Mikno. Yes, elves, elves can see well in the dark, Mikno answers as he stares into the woods at Jesse. Let's get this shelter built before it's too dark. Now let's get this shelter built before it's too dark for you to see. I don't believe the moon will be visible through the mountain up to up the through the mountain top tonight. Mikno walks to a clearing in the grove of trees. So what kind of structure do you like? he asks Lucius. I like whatever keeps the rain off my head, Lucius answers. A bit bland, but let's try it your way, Mikno responds as the ground around them begins to move. Four walls grow out of the ground surrounding them. The walls slope toward each other and eventually touch at the top, forming a dirt pyramid. Lucius and Mikno are now in total darkness inside the earthy pyramid. I think a door might be nice, Lucius says as he waves his hand in front of his face trying to see it. Now you want extra features. Whatever happened to keeping the rain off? Mikno asks as the opening forms in one side of the pyramid. I just wanted to be able to walk in and out, and breathing would be nice, Lucius says as he steps outside of the pyramid. This sure makes life outdoors easier, he says, surveying the pyramid. I can hardly wait to learn to do this. It does come in handy. But we are not done. Jesse wanted a fire, so we need a fireplace inside. A chimney forms on one of the sides of the pyramid. Lucius looks back inside, and there is now a fireplace on one of the walls. Now all we need is bedding to sleep on. Did you bring any along? Lucius asks Mikno. Some of the things I just can't create, but this isn't home. We are, after all, still camping. It's supposed to be rough. Mingo says as he sits down in an earth, earthy chair that has grown out of the ground. You sure know how to rough it, that's for sure, Lucius says sarcastically as he looks around behind himself. Where's my chair? Mingo creates a chair for Lucius and they both sit and stare at the gathering stars. The fairies dance, and the fairies that dance in the, and dance and flash in the night. Meanwhile, Jessie returns from the gathering wood, from gathering wood, but she isn't carrying it with her. It, ro it rolls along the ground beside her. Lucius watches as the wo wood rolling, watches the wood rolling, and asks, "You can control the wood?" "No, I'm not controlling the wood. The wood is dead. It has no energy left. I'm controlling the earth beneath it." She explains that the wood rolls into an earthy pyramid. Now, let's cook some dinner, she announces as she walks into the pyramid. You go help her. I'll tie up the horses and join you soon, Mikno says to Lucius. Lucius follows Jesse into the pyramid, carrying his bag. Inside the pyramid, inside the pyramid, it already looks different. 
Jesse has created chairs and a table out of the earth. She pulls a cloth from her bags, her bag, and drapes it across the dirt table. She turns the fi- she turns to the fireplace, which is already full of wood, and says, "Now all we need is fire." Lucius sits down at the table, waits a moment, and then says, "What are you waiting for? Make one appear." We only control the elements, Lucius. We can't create them. Mikno says, entering the pyramid, carrying a bag and a huge, colorful, but clearly lifeless bird. Lucius turns in his chair. You scared me. You can't create fire with magic? No, we can only control the elements we are in contact with, remember? Mikno asks as he puts puts down his bag and gives the bird to Jesse. How do you have contact with fire? Won't it burn you? It is a dangerous element, but once you can control it, you will not be burned, Mignot explains as he pulls a necklace out from under his robes. On the end of the chain, there is a small piece of smoldering coal. He picks up the coal, holding it out for Lucius to see. This is my fire starter. I save these from every fire. I can keep them burning for quite some time. As I was saying, I can't create fire, but I can control it. I can even make it grow. With the finish of that statement, the small chunk of coal burst into flames in the palm of his hand. I can also make fire dance the way I wish. The flame becomes the shape of a bird and grows larger till it is the size of a crow. The flaming bird spreads its wings and begins to fly around Mikno the flaming wings flapping against his body. Most importantly, I can use it to start this, to start our fire. He points to the fireplace and the bird flies in, into it, followed by a stream of fire from the coal in, in his hands. The wood in the fireplace explodes in the flame. You were always a show off, Mickey, Jesse says as she pulls the feathers off the bird carcass. Jez, Jez, whoops, went too far. <laughs> Jesse finishes cleaning the bird and, bird and places it on a stick in the fireplace. It smells strange at first, but after the pin feathers burn away, the aroma makes everyone hungry. After dinner, the table disappears, and Mikno clears away the rocks and debris from the place, and places from three places on the ground. It's not a soft bed, but we'll have to do, he says, as he and hands Lucius two blankets that have been rolled up and tied together. <laughs> Lucius unties the blankets, uses one for a pillow, and the other he folds in half so he can cover the ground and himself. Mignon makes the opening in the wall closed till it's the size of a window. <laughs> you can still hear the door behind me. Mm-hmm. Lucius has... A hard time sleeping as the forest conti- continues its concert of noises. He wants to ask Mikno what the sounds are, but doesn't want to disturb his sleep. He stares out the window and watches the fairies light up the sky. He falls asleep watching the tree tops sway peacefully against the night sky. The elven forest is bustling with gossip. The creatures of the forest are talking of the human boy who will learn magic. It is too dangerous. The king can't let this happen. Humans are too dangerous, is widely whispered. Far across the woods, the wood watchers are also discussing the new human threat. Unclothed elven figures gather in the woods, and one woman stands in the middle of the gathering circle. Their porcupine their porcelain skin, I don't know why I said porcupine, their porcelain skin seems to glow in the dark. We must stop it from happening, the circle is saying to her. The woman in the middle begins to speak. This is the greatest threat we have ever faced. We have told the king the dangers of elemental magic, but to give that power to humans will be unthinkable. Mother Mother Earth tells us Elemental magic will destroy everything. She also tells us it will be the humans who will be the destroyers. We tried to stop the magic altogether, but now it seems too late. The prophecy is upon us. 
The only way to stop it now will be to destroy this human before he becomes too powerful. A woman in the circle steps forward. We can't act this soon. We must let the king turn him down. We don't have to kill him. Even, the king, even if the king turns him down, Mikno will still teach him, the woman in the middle retorts. But it's wrong to kill someone so innocent. We are the protectors of the woods, and he has done nothing to harm it, the circle pleads. He will bring the destruction of the world. He hasn't harmed the world yet, but he will. I am in no hurry to kill this boy either. I know he is innocent. I propose we watch him slowly. We already have a spy at their tavern, and she has told us that he will be staying there for a year before he ever starts attending this school. This spy will be the tool we need to gather information, and, and it will be the key. If we need to take drastic action, we will know where to strike. Our first target will not be the boy, it will be the teacher, the woman in the middle explains. The women in the circle murmur in agreement. They begin to scream violently and shake as their bodies shrink and distort. The circle transforms into a circle of wolves and howl, of wolves howling into the night. Sorry. Sorry. I'm, 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 I didn't, I didn't stop for that reason. Oh. There was just a page break there. Page break. <laughs> Mikno, Lucius, and Jesse. Wake as they hear the sound of the howling. Lucius sits upright and looks around, trying to focus his eyes in the darkness. What is that, he asks, as the sound reverberates through the pyramid. Don't be afraid, it's far away, Mikno says to calm Lucius. Mikno knows what the sound is. He has heard the sound before, and he knows regular wolves don't sound this way. The wood watchers make, make that noise when they arrive at when they arrive at the castle he was sure if they were trying he wasn't sure if they were trying to scare the king when they arrived or if it's just their way of announcing their arrival if it was a warning he didn't like it he couldn't think of anything he liked about them It's the wood watchers. They're sending a warning, Jesse whispers to the elven Mikno. Whispers to El in elven to Mikno. Don't scare him. Don't scare him any further. I know what it is, and I know what it means. We will be fine. We will protect him, Mikno whispers back. How can you be sure it's him they are after, Jesse replies. Hey, could you guys talk in English? I would like to know what you're whispering, Lucius conveys I apologize Lucius we were saying it sounded like great wolves and they were discussing how strange it is to hear them this late at night that's all Jesse explains as she walks a short distance over to Lucius and lightly strokes his hair Lucius doesn't believe the explanation but he trusts Je Jesse oh okay well I guess they're far away good night he says as he closes his eyes and lies down and pretends to sleep. Yes, let's all get some sleep, McNo announces, rolling over to get some sleep. <coughs> Jessie returns to her sleeping area and lies down, staring upward. The rest of the night goes by without any trouble. Everyone eventually gives in to their exhaustion and falls asleep. They wake as the new day floods into the window of the pyramid. Jesse relights the smoldering fire by the by touching the coals pulls out a large bag of some kind of flour and adds a large flagon of her jesse l to some in a bowl and makes some bread dough she wraps the dough around the stick and places it over the fire lucius and mcno roll up their blankets and place them into back into their bags after breakfast they tie their sacks back to their horses and Lucius watches as Mikno makes the pyramid disappear into the ground. It looks like snow melting. Once the house is gone, no one would be able to tell they were there at all. 
They all mount their respective horses and ride off following the road. The end. Chapter 5. Should I continue on? Sure. Did you scrap it? Mm hmm. Oh, geez. Okay. Now, what are you starting? Same. I just. I just couldn't get the concept down that I wanted. What was she going to be doing? Well, I kind of had this idea of her standing and with a scar pointing. Like we're going over there, but I just couldn't. I didn't get it right. I didn't just. I, and then her face, I couldn't get her features down that I. It wasn't angular enough? Angular enough, and and I think, if I remember right, I, I based her off an Asian. Yeah, which is fine. Uh, and, and so she just wasn't. She didn't have. She didn't look like the original character. Not that it mattered that much, but I kind of <laughs> wanted it to. Artists. God, so picky. <laughs> Chapter five. Well, so let me just do a little art thing here in, in the middle of it. There, there's three. There's, I keep bringing up these five C's. Five uh, C's. Five C's. These are Loomis's five C's. And, uh, is this first like the is five C's of survival, cordage, con cutting? Kind of. The okay. concept, uh, construction, uh, Contours, I think it is. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's spelled right. <laughs> Character, and then consistency. Well, yeah. That last one is, <laughs> I, as an artist, when I try to draw, I, I'm not consistent at all. So, right, and so, but he uses this 50s language, 60s, 50s. That he grew up with, and he called it being subordinate. So, you need to start with one, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. But five is subordinate to four. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Four is subordinate to three, three to two, and two to one. So, that means when you start drawing, you don't start with the consistency. And most people, Start there with stuff like uh, how you shade it, mm -hmm. how your lines are all like perfectly nice. Right. But so, you know, uh, I had a concept. I was trying to get this construction, but I jumped to character. But what I found though is when I tried to put character into it, I was noticing my construction was all off on the drawing. <laughs> and my contours weren't right. Or that's you know the actual the actual contours you want to construct it right like you know the head fits onto the neck right to the pelvis you know everything has to connect right and then you have to get the contours of the shapes right and then you have to add the character of it and then it all needs to look like it's the same drawing consistency right so all your lines need to match together in a consistent way, so it all looks like one coherent drawing. Uh, and if you don't subordinate the one to the other, then you'll have a hot mess at the end. Things will all look out of whack, but you will have drawn something that you don't want to change. And you'll see drawings like that all the time. They're, they're, they're messed up, there's anatomy problems, but man, they got all the shading right. They got this part. Maybe the face doesn't look so good, but all the rest of it's all awesome. Why? Because, you know, they did all that and didn't want to change it. You know, you got to be willing to just scrap it and move on to, you know. Well. Kill your darlings. So all call. of this stuff is actually going through your head when you're drawing? <laughs> uh-huh. Wow. Because mm. if it's... If, you know, that's, I mean, so what's fascinating is what most people don't generally understand, but your brain does subconsciously. You can look at something, you might not know the reason why it's really bad, 
but your brain just kind of off puts it <clears throat> and you're like S- for some reason I don't like that I don't know why but I don't hmm. maybe later you might figure it out but a lot of times people can't just right off the top of their head understand why something looks bad why why something's wrong hmm. that's weird so if I can spot that stuff and mitigate it in my process, then hopefully you'll you know, have a better, enjoyable experience, which means you'll want to buy my product, which means you will buy the next product, and you'll start buying my product just because I did it. All right. And that's what we're all working for, right? Right. So. There's artists out there, you've seen them, who, you know, it's like, oh, that's supposed to be the same character? Right. And you're like, oh, well, yeah, well, it's because they weren't consistent, they didn't get the construction right, and all types of stuff. So, yeah, that's my little rant. All okay. right. All right, chapter five. Sorry. Chapter five, King Marcon. They travel through the woods in silence. Lucius soaks up the scenery. The sun breaks through the leaves of the trees as the fairies busily fly around gathering berries and nuts from the plentiful trees and bushes. Lucius watches as the fairies gather up large piles of freshly picked food and load them into small sacks, which are loaded onto various birds for transport home. In a small clearing, Lucius spots a family of bears when the bears see the horses and riders, they stand and run away on their hind legs, like giant human with a slight slouch. They stand about eight feet tall and are covered with brown and black fur. Lucius is about to ask the question, but Jesse announces excitedly, Lucius, look, it's a family of Yeti. We are lucky to have seen them. They are very rare even here. Lucius doesn't say anything, he just stares open mouth as the yetis disappear from sight. They ride another half hour as they exit the trees, they can see the huge elven city. Lucius already knew it would be const- Lucius already knew it would be constructed from the white marble since Jezzy used the same rock to build her home, but he was awestruck by the sheer size of the city and the castle. The castle is nearly a mile wide at the base and has three six-story tall towers. A 25-foot tall white marble fence surrounds the city and the watchtowers are placed evenly around it. Between the fence and the castle is a giant city. Lucius can see the tops of buildings poking up over the top of the city walls. The city is surrounded by castle and spans miles in each direction. The sun reflects off the marble, making it shine like a star. Another page break. Mikmo and Lucius, Mikmo, Lucius, and Jesse ride up over a small hill following the road, which leads down a bridge and crosses over a small river flowing in front of the city. On the other side of the bridge are two large men, dressed in plate mail armor, on horses carrying lances. As they ride closer to the men, Lucius makes an interesting discovery. They aren't men. They are part of the horse. The lower part of their body is a horse, and the upper part is a man. They have enormous muscular bodies. Halt! they shout in voices so deep and powerful, Lucius feels the sound of the sound reverberating through his chest. Mikno comes to a stop in front of them. And pulls back his hood. Listen, you annoying buffoons. You know who I am, and yet you do this to me every time. Is it for fun, or are you just too thick in the head? Move aside. Who is that with you? The guardians asked, rearing on the guardian asked, rearing on his hind legs and staring down at Lucius. Every part of Lucius tells him to roam. 
The monster stares at him in a way hunters stare at prey. Mikno maneuvers his horse between the guards and Lucius. He continues to calmly address them. Do you mean the story hasn't reached you yet? Or are you too stupid to remember? Mikno asks sarcastically. He doesn't look like much. I thought humans were ferocious in battle, one of the guards gr grumbles deeply. I see you two wish to see the human. Well, take a look. Hopefully your feeble minds will be able to retain the image. Mikno says, waving his hand at Lucius in a behold all this glory manner. <clears throat> the guards, angered by the taunts of Mikno, respond. You better be careful, little elf. Your magic tricks can't help you when you've been run through. The guards asserts, poking Mikno with his lance. I believe you two are, f you two are far too violent for such a job. You need to learn to keep calm, Mikno says, leaning against the lance. I think you should cool off. The leaves on the grounds rustle and lift into the air, and the wind begins to howl. The guards stare at the leaves, and Lucius can see through, see the thought process on his face as he realizes the wind isn't naturally occurring. The guard angrily raises his front legs into the air, trying to stomp and kick Mikno from his horse, but his reaction proves to be too slow as a powerful wind sweeps both guards off the bridge and into the shallow river below. Mikno trots his horse toward the castle, followed by Jezzy. Lucius pauses to look down at the guards, who are now struggling in the water to get off of each other. He hurries to catch up to Mikno. What are those things, he asks. Those are centaurs. The tailor who made your clothes mentioned them. We use them as guards and cavalry. They are fierce and powerful in battle, Mikno answers. Do you hate them? I don't hate them all. I don't hate anything. I just dislike those two profusely, Mikno says, looking back at the, at the bridge. The centaurs are dragging themselves out of the river and shaking off the water as a, the water as a dog would. They angrily shake their fists at Mikno and yell. Mikno and Jezzy laugh as they glance at each other, Lucius not wanting to be left out asks, what are they saying? The usual. We're going to get you, kill you, smash your bones into powder, blah, blah, blah. Mikno says as he uh, says in a deep grumbling voice trying to imitate one of the centaurs. They burst into laughter as they approach the 20 foot tall city gate. The city streets are crowded with people, all from different races, the road forks into five different directions as they enter the city. <clears throat> Excuse me. The main road continues through the city as the city till it reaches the castle located at the center. The buildings of the city are rather plain compared to the white marble centerpiece of the city. They are made from wood, some from brick, and are densely packed together and look as if they are just extensions of the building next to them. Mikno climbs off his horse and greets some people who are gathered at the front gate to meet him. Three students and one teacher. A poorly dressed dwarf approaches, gathers the horses, and leads them away to a stable located near the front gate. Mikno, it is good to see you, and you have returned unscathed. A black robed teacher says as he shakes Mikno, Mikno's hand. It has been a long it hasn't been long, Kindle, Mikno replies. Kindle is an elf, the same height as Mikno. He has short, spiky, platinum blonde hair, bushy eyebrows, and a long nose. Dimpled chin, and he has a pot belly, which seems to be in good shape. Kindle laughs a little at Mikno's remark. You know how I love to worry, he says as he steps back from Mikno. Mikno looks over to Lucius and starts to speak in English. I would like you to meet Lucius. Lucius steps forward and shakes Kindle's outstretched hand. I am pleased to meet you, Lucius. I am Kindle, he says, shaking Lucius' hand enthusiastically. 
Hello, sir. Pleased to meet you. Lucius responds politely. I would like you to meet my two students, Kendall announces excitedly as he walks over to the three students. This is Tona. She is a first-year student, and she is a dwarf. Have you ever met a dwarf? Kendall asks in a condescending tone. Lucius gives Mikno a he-has-got-to-be-kidding-me look and returns his attention back to Kendall. Yes, sir, I met one at Jesse's tavern, he says, pointing to Jesse. Kendall looks at Jesse as though he hadn't seen her. Oh, I'm, oh, my, I'm sorry, Jesse. Where are my manners? How are you? He asks as he rushes over to shake her hand. I'm managing every day, Jesse replies. Lucius shakes Tona's hand and says hello. Kendall turns back to Lucius and announces, I'm afraid she doesn't know English yet. Tona smiles up, up to Lucius politely. She has a messy shoulder-length red hair, thick red eyebrows and a yellow eyes, and a broad nose. Her robe is green, signifying a first-year student. This quiet soul over here is Zed, Kendall announces, pointing to another green-robed student. Zed has his hood pulled up and his head down so no one can even see his face. A shy voice comes out from under his hood. I don't speak English well. I can say hello, he says with his arms crossed in front of him. Hello, good to meet you, Lucius replies. Migna walks over to the, the last student who is wearing a red robe. This is my student, Maz. Maz is a male elf with long platinum, platinum blonde hair pulled back into a ponytail. He has smooth elven features. Greetings, I am Maz, he says, holding out his hands. Holding out his hand. Lucius shakes his hand, pleased to find someone who speaks English, and replies, it's good, to, it's good to meet you, Maz. I am Lucius. Well, now that we all know each other, let's get back to normal. Don't you have a class to attend? Migno asks, addressing the students. The students all bow and walk away, disappearing into the crowd, crowded streets. Migno looks into looks to Kendall and asks, Is the king ready to see me? Kendall chuckles and replies, Of course not. He is the king. It is tradition that you wait an eternity for him. Kendall leads Mikno and Jesse and Lucius on a long trek through the city toward the castle doors. People crowd through the city, through the streets of the city. Most of them are traders looking to peddle their wares at one of the many shops in town. Your student, your students are doing well. I have been teaching them new techniques, Kendall says to Mikno. Mikno nods. Where are we going to be waiting, he asks. The king has a private dinner party waiting for you. He doesn't want to do this in public. The queen will attend the normal feast, and we will dine with the king at the private one. The Kendall explains as they enter the doors of the castle, which are held open by two elven guards. The front, of the, the front room of the castle has a grand staircase, which curves up to the second floor. The room is open, allowing for a view up to the six, a view up six stories to the vaulted ceiling. A white marble chandelier is suspended on a chain from the ceiling and is lit with a thousand with thousands of tiny candles. The white marble stairs are padded with red carpet. Kendall leads the party up the staircase to the second floor and down a hallway, which is lined with doors every ten feet on each side of it. The hallway leads to a gargantuan room with five long tables set up for a grand feast. The room could easily hold 5,000 guests. In front of the room, two thrones are set up with tables for dining. This is the formal dining room, Lucius, Kendall announces. Kendall announces, pointing around the room as he walks to a door located next to the thrones. Through, the do through this door is the private dining room. He opens the door, allowing everyone through. The room is almost cozy compared to the room they just left. It has a fireplace and a huge round table capable of sitting 20 people. There are two doors out of the room, the one they, they just entered and one on the opposite wall. No one is in the room yet, but the table is set for a feast. 
similar to the formal dining room. Kendall pulls out a chair. We are to stay here till the meal starts, he announces, taking a seat. The table is of dark mahogany, which contrasts beautifully with the white marble. Sorry. The table is a dark mahogany, which contrasts beautifully with the white marble plates, shiny silver utensils, and crystal drinking goblets. A white marble chandelier is similar to the one in the front staircase room, but smaller, only holding about 50 small candles, lights the room. The chairs are carved mahogany, and there is two throne-like chairs meant for the king and queen. The table has a jumbo candle holder in the middle of it, and seven two-feet-tall flickering, two-feet-tall candles flickering hypnotically. <laughs> the candles reach a foot, a foot in length before the movement and muted conversation can be heard outside of both ex exits to the room. The doors open and a colorfully dressed halfling walks inside holding a well-polished bugle. He blows the horn and in a voice far too big for his small size announces, King Marcon and Queen Ty Tyria have arrived. All must stand and as they enter, everyone rises and the king and queen enter hand in hand. The king, a tall, slim elf, has his blonde hair trimmed short and wears a golden band around his forehead. His square jaw and clean features are impressive as as is his woven, woven gold clothing. Two female elf servants follow Queen Tyria. One holds her floor-length platinum hair and the other holds a train of her magnificent silver dress, which is accented by beautiful green gemstones and a beautiful green gemstone necklace and sparkling tiara. The king and queen walk around the table toward the door leading to the grand dining room. The halfling caller enters the door first, blows his bugle, and announces to the packed grand dining room, Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for Her, her Majesty Queen Tyria. The queen exits through the door and into the formal dining room. The halfling caller remains standing at attention by her side as the door closes behind her. The king turns to address his private party. Please be seated, everybody, he says in, an Eng he says in English to the surprise of everyone. As the everyone sits, the king rings a small bell and ten elven servants flood into the room. Some are carrying platters with roast birds and large grass of red wine, others carrying hefty pottery cookware with various side dishes. The food is placed on the table, and the servants leave the room quickly. As the servants close the door, the king declares, Everyone, please eat. We can talk as we dine. Everyone is well into their meal, and had, and nothing has been discussed for fifteen minutes. King, The king addresses Vigno. I thought you had something to discuss. Please don't be shy. Who is your new friend? Thank you, sire. Vigno stands and continues. I would like you to consider Lucius as a new student. The king surveys Lucius, who is now standing by Mikno. Mikno, I, like everyone else, knew that your trip to the woods to save this poor boy. I also know you will teach him whether I give you use of the castle or not. My concern is the safety of the kingdom. You know the trouble we have with the Wood Watchers. You know of their prophecy. Now here we are, and the prophecy as they see it is coming true, he pronounces to Mikno. Sire, the Wood Watchers want to ban the use of elemental magic on the basis of a prophecy that has no proof. They claim we are the destroyers of land, but we haven't destroyed anything. We share the earth with all the creatures, and we are closer to the earth more than any other creature, we are able to touch the earth in such a way as to become part of it. We can share the energy with the earth, and it shares our, its energy with us. The wood watchers are throwing away their heritage in a belief, a story designed to brainwash them into obedience, Vigno declares. 
The king puts down his fork and wipes his face with his cloth napkin. The wood watchers are people of my kingdom, and I have sworn to protect it. This is the kind of act that can throw us into civil war. The king takes a drink from his crystal goblet. On the other hand, this boy is a new member of my kingdom. I cannot turn him away as a citizen, but I can reject him as a student. This will be a hard decision. The, the king takes another drink and continues. I understand the boy will need to learn the language before he could attend. Is that correct? Yes, sire, that is true. Good. I will not give my official ruling till that day, the king announces. Oh, and one more thing. The king, seri king, the king stares seriously at Lucius. If you do attend school here, I promise that it will not be easy on you, boy. People of this kingdom already spread rumors about you. The elves and creatures of this land will distrust you because you are human. Are you prepared for such a life? The king asks Lucius. Lucius swallows heavily before he answers. Sire, I am not violent like the humans in your past. I am here because I have nowhere to go. You have heard of our past? The king asks. And Lucius nods. That's good. It saves me the time of explaining. I have humans in my kingdom, but no other humans in this kingdom have ever requested to learn our secrets before. The people of this kingdom will find this offensive, and most will hate you. I asked you, are you willing to deal with the consequences of learning? The king asks again, leaning forward in his giant seat. Yes, sir, I am. Lucius forces out as he stands tall and proud. The king leans back in his chair, grabbing his goblet again. I admire your bravery, he says, raising his glass and taking a big swig. Now let us eat before the food gets cold. Doo -doo -doo. No one addresses the king fur further during the meal, and when the leave and when the when he leaves, Kindle leans enthusiastically forward and starts speaking to Mikno. I think that went well. What do you think? It is what I expected, Mikno answers casually, drinking his wine. I knew he wouldn't give a solid answer, but he couldn't just turn us away. The next step is to teach you how to behave like an elf, Jedi says, nudging Lucius playfully. Are you ready to go home and learn? Yes, I think I can handle it, Lucius answers. You will stay here for the night, and then you and Jesse will be returning home together, Mikno explains. You aren't coming with us, Lucius asks in a panic. What about the dangers of the woods? Don't worry, Lucius. We will be traveling with the relief guard, Jesse, with the relief guards, Jesse announces. Lucius gives her a confused look, and then Jesse explains. The relief guard will travel to the guard tower located by my tavern. Once they are there, they will relieve the guards who are there and they will travel back here. It happens at the end of every month. Anyway, let me show you to your rooms, Kendall says, standing up from his chair. They follow Kendall out of the room through the grand dining room, which is empty now except for a few, for a crew of servants who are cleaning the cluttered tables. Kindle leads them back down the hallway and stops at one of the many doors. He announces, This will be your room, Jesse. He walks to the next door and holds it open. And this will be your room, Lucius. I believe you know where your home is, Mikno. He bows his head one last time and heads down the hall. Mikno turns to Lucius. I will see you when I can. I want you to listen to Jesse. I'm sorry I won't be able to say goodbye tomorrow. Stay close to Jessie and she will keep you safe. Good night. See you later, he says as he squeezes Lucius' shoulder and rubs his head. He bows to Jessie, who is standing in her bedroom doorway, and walks down the hallway. I'll be right here next door if you need anything, Jessie says to Lucius. 
Good night, Lucius. She says as she closes her door. Lucius' head is swimming. As he closes the bedroom door, he would normally feel frightened being in a strange place alone. He argues silently with his fears. I don't think I should be left alone in a room by myself. I'm not really alone. Jesse is right next door. The room's giant size isn't much of a comfort to him as he looks around. It is, it is lit with lanterns along the wall, but the light isn't strong enough to reach the corners of the room. He walks the perimeters of the room. There's nothing here with you. I'm just checking to be sure. This is silly. Better safe than sorry. After checking the corners, he checks under the large four-poster bed, which is big enough to hold three people. See, I told you. No one was no one was here. The castle is safe. There is no dangerous no dangerous here, he thinks to he thinks as he feeds a log into the fireplace. He undresses, douses the lanterns, and jumps into the giant bed. The bed with the fluffy pillows and thick down filled blanket, Lucius shoves all but one of the pillows off the bed and covers himself with the blanket to his chin. That was chapter five. Uh-oh. <laughs> I know. It, it goes by faster than you'd think. So how much time have we taken up? An hour. That's pretty good. Okay, well, hey, well that was another two chapters of the exciting first book. Exciting? I hope it's exciting. Anyway. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, you know, all these first chapters is really just uh, stage setting, you know, setting the, uh, you know, giving you a look at the new world. But, um, right. you know, as a, as a writer, you can, you can see why, as I was writing these first, you know, books, uh, you know, when I write, I can actually, I, I see everything in my head as a, as a, as a visual thing and um, you know I have to translate that into language to put it on paper and hopefully create a picture in people's mind with the words um, but you can see why I wanted to do it as a graphic novel also because mm -hmm. I think this thing it would just be visually stunning you know to see as a movie and that's how I see it in my head as a movie so, uh, you know, it was, it was so exciting when I found an artist that could actually, you know, just from descriptions, put this on paper or on computers now, I guess. He, nobody draws on, well, he still draws on paper, but now he draws on this computer screen. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Probably should get on paper, but. <laughs> I like doing it on here. Well, I do it on here before if I'm gonna color and ink it. Mm -hmm. It's so much faster. And I know I can scan it and all that stuff, but I'm gonna have to scan it. It's a scan is big enough. And so I don't know if I. Uh, it's just a bunch of annoying stuff. I think, uh, you know, two chapters at a time should, should be very, pretty good. That's another two chapters. Oh, right. uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, as far as um, I think we should um, really try to get these, uh, you know, we need to really concentrate on getting, you know, like the link from the website to the podcast um set up and then we also need to uh like I, like I said we need to talk about um you know burntoutstudios.com is our website um what other things do they say on podcasts all the time you know smash the like button you know smash stuff like that like 
subscribe subscribe um, share share yeah you know if you liked it share it with your friends you know what if you know anybody else that you think would oh that was another thing that I'm um, uh, Brayley um, shout out to Brayley hi Brayley anyway um, that one of the things that she was saying is uh, we need to um, set up you know how on our on our YouTube they have uh, pl the they have the playlist and the videos mm -hmm. and stuff we need to uh, make playlists you know so all the all the what podcasts where I'm reading we can have that as the uh, the oh. short, shattered time story yeah um, you know that we can have those different categories we could also have a category where it's just you drawing you know stuff like that right so that was a, a, a good suggestion <laughs> so that's Jesse what's she doing just she's leaning up against something or yeah. okay but well, I, I kind of had the idea for like opening up like the bar doors but but then maybe I thought just maybe standing in the bar door looking out at the sun or looking out at the place and mm -hmm. just and if this was a scene in the comic I would then have patrons in the back you know right doing all their create you know their stuff and she just kind of reminiscing about uh, Bo Greek back there somewhere about about her place I guess I don't know right it, the hard part what I'm trying to figure out is coming up with her outfit like I have an outfit over there but I wanted to well yeah I, I mean she's a uh, uh, she's well traveled so um right she likes uh, all kinds of different uh, um, clothing. Right. Well, I kind of like the idea of the of trying to meld an Elvis slash uh, Victorian type of right. barmaid's outfit. Um, frilly, lots of lots of excess to it, but yet yeah, still cut in the right spots for right. to keep her patrons coming back right right it's what it's what yeah everybody likes the visual right uh, <laughs> so no, i like the face though i think the face came out halfway decent right uh, i think i think and i don't know why i don't know if it's if it's me or what maybe you can does it seem nicer here than over there? Uh, you're asking what the, the, uh, what I don't, the uh, or does it look exactly the same? See me, I don't know. For some reason, when I see it on my tablet, my lines look so much nicer and more exact, more. And then when I see it like reproduced over like on YouTube and stuff, it seems like something's lost. I don't. Or when I put on Instagram, for some reason, it seems like I don't know why it looks. In my mind, so much nicer. Well, it's funny because that tablet that, that's, over there, that's, I'm, I'm pointing at the OBS right, right. stream on the other on the other monitor. What the people are saying, right? So, but um, you're right. I mean, uh, on the tablet, the screen and stuff, uh, it it looks more like paper. Right. I don't know if there's something lost. I mean, I don't know what it is. It's just like it looks fuller. It looks. I don't know. It's really weird. It looks so much. Yeah. I think when I created her, I was listening to uh, this YouTuber, uh, Comic Girl, Comic Book Girl 19. And so she had her hair then. Uh, I think she influenced her a lot. I like I can't, uh, it's not bad. I like the the tall drink, you know, the tall mm -hmm. beer. Yeah, you would you would wonder if a person traveled around the world as much as she did, and uh, you know, spent all that time socializing. Basically, that's, that's all she was doing was you know, going from one place to the next, meeting people and learning all about culture. But uh, 
you would th- you would think people that are and she, you know she obviously hung out in bars. How many drinks does she know how to make? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. How many drinks she knows how to make? Not to mention, right? right. Just her Elvis stuff, right? Um, I feel like uh, it looks okay. I think she is compressing up. Uh, I did want to make her a little. I think you you mentioned she's uh, a little hippier. Well, yeah, she's um older, so she's a little bit. Yeah, she's got a little bit more uh, fat on her body than any other elf you'll ever come across. It doesn't mean that she's fat. It just means she's it's the way he likes. It. She's got more curves than a, an elf normally does. He likes the curves. Most of the elves. Uh, most of the elves look like the uh, aliens you see on, um, you know, people's recounting of alien abductions. <laughs> you know, they're tall and skinny, but not with big heads, but, you know, just tall and skinny. <laughs> and white skin instead of gray skin. When did I put all these lines? I don't remember them. Oh, that was when you were trying to say there were people in the background. I you're right. Mm-hmm. Those are the people. And that was what that was supposed to represent. No more people. <laughs> Although that would make a cool illustration, I think. Oh, yeah. I think it would, too. But I, I kind of like the the way I described the, that tavern that she built. You know, kind of a run-down looking building but yeah I think it'd be fun <laughs> I like the I, I kind of like the idea of the frilly fluffy stuff <laughs> I don't know why well she definitely likes feminine things right. and she's the only elf that you'd really run across that uh, wears makeup her and uh Royalty, anyway. Is that a little bar apron? Mm. Oh, that's kind of cool, actually. Kind of like a Spanish mm-hmm. uh, flair to it. Flair to it, yeah. yeah. I can see it all red and crimson with black, mm-hmm. and then the white uh, waitress. Uh, right. Maybe one of those little gold chains that go around her belly. Oh, I mean, yeah. But yeah. Well, actually, I, I, I'm kind of cool, too. Because <laughs> uh, she likes jewelry also. You know what I've been watching on uh, Netflix? Um, that's I don't know why I got so hooked into it, but it's really, really fun to watch. I really don't like chokers that much, but... I, I can't see what you're drawing. Oh. I mean, I guess I can look at the small screen, but like you said, it's better looking on the big screen. <laughs> anyway. Um, Choker? Nice. But... But anyway, um, uh, have you watched any of that Scientology thing? No. Oh. Well, the Leah, Re- Leah Rem- Remy? Remy? I, I, I think a long time ago I watched it. Well, the thing is, is like, I, I'm fascinated, like, uh, one of the things that I like to study is, uh, um, I study North Korea, you know? Because mm-hmm. I always wonder, how do people get that much control over, over other people? You know, because that stuff fascinates me. And, you know, that stuff is really what they, uh, mm-hmm. a town called Liberty is about, you know. <coughs> is uh, how it's people... Still loyalty and then point a gun at them. Well, yeah, but I mean, um, there's also, you know, the promises that they get of, uh, you know, what they're going to achieve. Um, and... Uh, well, yeah, but what I was saying... Oh, I'm sorry. 
What? Well, I was going to say, I mean, you just look at like, uh, <coughs> I know it's Korean, so it's different, but mm-hmm. the Korean, the whole Asian, the whole over there as well. But like Japanese with the samurai and the daimyo, mm-hmm. you, you inspire the loyalty. Right. And then threaten the sword. Right. Right. When they get out, you, but you make it so they the loyalty is more important. Than, you know. It's, 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 oh yeah. So I I can see that with North Korea because they they had similar culture. They didn't have quite, but if mm-hmm. there is. Yeah, they a still have a, you know um, you're you're supposed to treat uh, elders with you know ultimate respect and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, but um, you know when I uh, watch this Scientology thing, man, it's uh, it's amazing how. Because what's fascinating is, yes, there are people that are born into Scientology, and you can you can understand why they follow along with the program because they've n- never known anything else, you know. Mm-hmm. But there's so many Scientologists that joined it at the age of 20, right? You know, and you would think, you know, if you see certain things, you know, that you would just say, "I'm not going to do this," but these people spend. To get to uh, a certain level in Scientology, you have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get to that point. Mm-hmm. By the time you go all the way through to uh, your OT10 or 9, I think is the, the highest, right. um, uh, you're, you've spent a million dollars. Right. It's crazy. But the, the thing that they do, though, that's very important is that they... You know, I mean, barring the religious aspect of it, if if it was a scam, I'm not saying what it was, but if it was a scam, I would make it to where if if they spend the money, you make sure that they get the jobs. You know, and so then therefore, well, I spent the money, I was blessed with the job. You know what I mean? It's It's... You don't make it feel like they paid for the job, mm-hmm. but that they got blessed with the job, and you make sure they got that one pivotal role. Then all of a sudden, and you're like, "See what happens." Well, you're yeah. talking about just the uh, the acting part, just the actors, right? And I, and I know there's all types of, but it's crazy because um, you know they, you know these people will join Scientology and they'll get into the part of it called the Sea Org, where you're actually working for yeah. Scientology. And yeah, it's just crazy. I mean, we watch this. If you want to watch a, a an interesting show, and you'll get hooked on it just like me. Yeah, I've watched it. They talk about the the what they have to do to escape the rain, yeah. and, and then they chase them down. And, right. And stuff. Like and that. anybody who's considered an enemy, I mean, the stuff that they do to you know go after these enemies, yeah. and they outcast you, and mm-hmm. they ban you, and all that stuff. Yeah. It's crazy. Uh, have, have you watched the Social Network? Um, not the, Social Net. Yeah, Social. Is that the one that's the movie? That's, but not no, the. Yeah, the Social. Dilemma. The is Social that, Dilemma. Yeah, yes, I've watched that. That was pretty good. It's very good. That was like, ooh, yeah. Because yeah, I mean, but it's 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 uh. Because actually, uh, I think we actually canceled I, I think Ro- Netflix. I, I think Rogan was actually talking about that movie, The Social Dilemma. Everybody has. I know Tim Pool has talked about it. So I finally watched it and was like, uh, things I already knew, but yet, right? But yet, you don't think it's that insidious. Oh, it's it's bad. Because it's like I think it's like what Tim always c- kind of says on his podcast. You know, it's like. Uh, you know, evil is paid with good intentions. You know, you, you don't realize that doing this will lead to that unless you're willing to pick your head up and look. Right. It's kind of like that movie, uh, but Real Genius, with Val Kilmer. Okay. Where he's the gen right, and and then Laszlo at the end comes and says, "What do you think this is for? Why would you make a laser that could shoot through the atmosphere?" And then why are you making the light, you know, the mirror, you're making a weapon. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, all you have to do is pull your head up from 
I created this massive, awesome laser and that amazing, oh yeah, because that's what you want to do. Mm-hmm. But he's like, if you look farther down the road, mm-hmm. you've made a massive weapon. Mm-hmm. You know, and so it's, it's, I think it's naive. And, and, and the worst part about that show is to watch the people who made it kind of be like, oh well. Kind of like, well, maybe we shouldn't have done it. But, I got lots of money in the process, so, oh, well. I don't let my kids use it. Right. But I'm rich, so screw you. Well, it's funny how people, really smart people, can be so dumb. Um, Because, I mean, it it happens all the time. It happens all the time. (laughs) My dad used to call my friends the smartest. Dumb people, you know. The dumbest smart person he's ever met. Because he just has so much information stored up in his head, but some of the dumb things. This kind of, once again, on Tim Pool's show, Ian mm-hmm. might be one of the dumbest smart people you've ever seen. Mm-hmm. The idiotic, moronic stuff that comes out of that guy's mouth sometimes is staggering. Just staggering. If it doesn't work, well then we ought to just nuke the whole thing and start over with something different. With what? Well, I don't know. We can make it better. And Tim looks at him. No, you can't. Right. That's the whole point, you dumb idiot. <laughs> you can't make it better. This is the best thing that's ever been done. All we have to do is get good people to run it. Right. And if we would just foster a society of goodness, yeah. then maybe things would work better. Well, but the thing is, is the problem that you're having is that... It, 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 <laughs> it comes down to a uh, sign. Okay, okay. That's a uh, wow. That was quite a bongo beat. Um, it it comes down to a uh, um. Sorry. No. She she left for had to go to work yesterday. Uh huh. And about four hours in, about three and a half four hours in, he decided. Where's mom? I think, and went looking for him. He was up here banging on these doors, crying. Trying to think that she's in here. For about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, I, I brought him downstairs. Brian, he came back up. I brought him downstairs again. You know, and, uh, stop crying. You know, and finally, I said, open the door. See, look, there's nobody here. Right. And then on the, he had to climb, he had to get up on the bed so he could look over the side to make sure she wasn't there, I think. And, and then he just, just bawled, just cried for, he cried for a good hour. Jeez. And then finally I took him out with the remote control car. And that broke crying until five minutes into it, he tripped over it, bumped his head, and gave himself a bloody nose. And then some really crying happened. Right. And we came in and he just mm, fell asleep and. She came home early because of that. And, well, I was having the hour, and I was like, can you come? Maybe you... Right. It, well, she was going to go to the store after work. Mm. And I was like, just don't go to the store after work. Just come home first. That's all I care. Just come home first. Don't just linger long... Linger and do all this stuff. Just come home and help. Mm. And uh, and then it was like... She's like, well, I can come home now. And I was like, we just went outside. He started playing with cars. Like, you don't have to come home. Now, just wait. Just don't go to the store. Come home, then then we'll go to the store. And then he, and I was like, eh, you might want to come home now. <laughs> because he, he hit so hard, and he's run, okay. trip, knocked himself in the door, you know. And he does that stuff all the time, but he's just fine, you know. Right. But this time, he was, like, really quiet and was sleepy. <laughs> So I kept on waking him up, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, a little worried. And so we took him to see a doctor, and he's like, he looks all right. And he, by the time we got right. there, he was up and running right. and being fine. He's like, he's, he's like, just wake him up in the middle of the night and see if he's responsive. Right. So I did that. I came in last night and kind of shook him around. He's like, stop. <laughs> so I was like, that's responsive enough to me. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. Any, anyway, um. Sorry. What I, uh, Tangent. Going, yeah, going back to, uh, well, that was obviously a big distraction. 
Um, but, um, you know, all these people, I think the biggest problem we have as a society, as a world, is um, there's two groups of people on a basic level of the ones that, you know, think the ends justify the means and they'll just do anything they can to achieve the whatever goal it is and um you know and then there's the other group that's, that says no the ends do not justify the means and and um you know you know we uh you know the scientists and all those people that are building these things um you know that are just focused on that th you're, you're right they're they're just focused on doing that thing that they've set their mind to and there's other people that are you know are using them to get what they want looks like that mcdonald's commercial right that mcdonald's movie oh yeah they made a great burger they made milkshakes they had a great product it wasn't something they had speed but it was the guy looking at the outside went hey mm -hmm. you know that's usually what happens uh, you know it's just like well, I, I keep going on. And even, even he was kind of an idiot because yeah. at first he didn't know how to. He knew that there was money making opportunity there, but it wasn't until he met that guy that told him to start buying properties. Mm -hmm. You know, that's when he started making money because he was he was this close to being bankrupt. Right. You know. Well, you can't. You can't. Well, it wasn't until. You know, you, the owner has to make it profitable. Right, and it, and he realized that if all they did is paid him rent, mm -hmm. then if they made their money, he got his. But he wasn't he wasn't on the hook if they didn't make the money. Right, you know what I mean, and and that was brilliant. Uh, but this other stuff, you know, there's uh, I I look I think of all the time, you know, selling shattered time as a as a movie or a product, you know, and. And what the negotiations will have to be to go through that stuff, you know, and you hear about lowballing creatives and stuff like that, and and it's like uh, you don't have that without the creative creating it. Mm -hmm. Well, it won't be a movie without us bringing it to them. So fine. Right. You have no money, and I have no money. Right. Screw you. But if you want to take it, then we'll both make money. Mm -hmm. At least both of us make some. You know, don't just the the idea of like the creative created it, mm -hmm. but something like a like a low level exec, uh, right. executive producer makes more on it than you. It's like no, what the right. what the what. Mm -hmm. It, it just, it was like that thing with uh, Michael Brewer way back when, when that guy wanted to publish our book. Mm -hmm. And he said he wanted 25% to publish the book, or 50%, I think. And I said, okay, so how is he going to get it out, market it, and publish it? And he goes, oh, no, that's, we have to, we have to pay for them to be printed, and then we'll take them around the comic book shops and sell them, like, on consignment in the shops. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And I'm like, well, then what the fuck is he doing? Yeah, why, why, why do we need you? What, 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 what? And he's like, well, he's going to publish it. That's, well, not publish not. It. That's not publishing That's it. That's not publishing it. Right. I'm like, if I'm printing it and I have to take it out, mm -hmm. I'm the one getting all the money for it. Right. Uh, and then it was like, well, well, we'll split the shares across everybody equally. I'm like, wait a second. He can write five books a month. Right. He can ink five books a month. He can color five. He can letter 20. Mm -hmm. I can draw one. Right. I said, bullshit. Right. <laughs> We're well, going to cut it up equal. Well, that was, a, that was one of the things I was, when I was talking to Braley uh, last night, I mean, uh, or yesterday, I was, you know, you, you, um, you know, we had, at one time, we had found an inker that, uh, the biggest problem we had was that Inker actually was already in the business and he had all of these d different jobs working for Marvel and, and people where the, he was getting paid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was the biggest problem is he basically ignored our project even though he said he liked it and he liked the script and all that kind of stuff. 
he ignored he ignored our stuff because he wasn't getting paid. He at least getting paid on the back end. But I mean, um, I personally think you know the back end money can be uh, really profitable because you know me I'm as the writer I'm willing to take the smallest cut because that's the way normally when uh, it comes down to uh, profit on a uh, the sales of just the book um, the profit most of it goes to the artist um, the largest uh, slice of the pie but um artist you know, and writer I'm looking at the money for you know even further down the road to when we try to sell this idea to movies or when we try to sell this idea to video games mm -hmm. you know I think this would be a fantastic video game could you imagine a, an open earth game where you can go to all these different you know time periods not just holy universe. shit yeah time you, you, you can <laughs> you can portal to mars portal to right. some moons to saturn some out bases i mean i'm always uh, impressed stations on the edge i'm always impressed with the Insa assassin's creed games because they're so big mm -hmm. this would be monumentally big and then i played was playing for a long time uh a mobile game star wars galaxy of heroes mm -hmm. and that's a turn-based pokemon type of thing I think this would be great that way too. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, and, and and so because of that, that's why if we could bring on a colorist right. who also helped with some of the social media stuff. Yes. Uh, I a hey, to me that's a it if if you can help us get there, then right. I, I'm I'm cool with splitting the pie. I don't I don't right. And like like I said, the money's on the back end. But the 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 thing I've been trying to figure out to do is how to make it as we go. Uh, we 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 can we can start a sh sh Kickstarter for this if we had a colorist mm -hmm. and they put some stuff out and we could launch something. We would start doing we mm -hmm. doing these podcasts. To gain some viewership, and then, and then if if our viewers would spread it, help spread it, mm -hmm. then we could launch a successful Kickstarter. And if we could launch a successful enough one, that would pay the color, that pay me the time to do it full time. My wife wouldn't right. have to work, you know, and you could write full time, or you could even work and, but, but even still, I I, mm -hmm. I keep going over back and forth with you about. I still think book one needs to rewrite, but that's all right. Well, I mean, we got the first, uh, we had the first 23, and you're actually redoing the first 23 pages again. I know. You know, it's funny. Uh, well, I've, I've got that first little section, mm -hmm. but then I still wonder about even that, whether or not, and because see, the, my, 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 my thing is, is, is I want to be able to script out the whole first book, mm -hmm. not just script out, but like almost thumbnail it. Right. Because when we if we do a Kickstarter, I want to be able to tell people exactly what they're getting, right? And and be able to logically know when we could get it to them. Right. That's very important. You know, uh, it seems like some of the most successful uh, guys I've been looking at who do their books, do the Kickstarters or the Indiegogo, is they get to the point almost where they put their Indiegogo up. And they've got 80% of the project done before they even put it up. Mm -hmm. Some have even got it all the way done. But they've been able to do that because they got money from other ones. Mm -hmm. And instead of just keeping them, he threw it into another project, you know. Right. Uh, but, and, and that, to me, that solves the problem of... <clears throat> Well, we're just going to get paid on the back end. Well, when's that? Well, it's going to take us nine months to draw and make the book and get it all done and ready to print. And then we'll, we'll get money and blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, if we could start a Kickstarter, we could get money now right. to make it, mm -hmm. put it out. And then if we had the fans to do the Kickstarter, and then as we were making it, we could stream it. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, like I, like and I was saying, if we can get some donations while we're doing that along the way, then that helps add to the mm -hmm. 
to the to the pot, you know, and because that was a uh, one of the things that I, you know, like I was saying before, is it'd be really neat to um, to uh, finish some of those um, uh, town called Liberty uh, books and uh, actually stream it on here. You know, I think that'd be fun. That'd be something I would flip. Each that'd page. be something I'd be. You know, it's like well, if we got. If we did good enough with this, mm -hmm. take a chunk of that and throw it into that with a right. different artist, you know, and just mm -hmm. uh, let them go do that, and you, right. you can write it and do it. And, yeah. And uh, maybe I could take a tiny bit of chunk for help creating the idea of it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but just a little <laughs> bit. You know, right. Well, no, I mean. Uh, well, I've always said, you know, that with that Michael, right? Mm -hmm. It was like. Why are we giving that guy 50% of, of it? I said, what we should be doing is why don't we just draw it and make it as we're going mm -hmm. and charge people like the monthly subscription, $3. Right. I'll take a dollar, you take a dollar, and you take a dollar. Mm -hmm. And we do it as we're doing it monthly. Mm -hmm. And then all we got to do is think of as subscriptions. Right. So if we get 10,000 people to subscribe to our book, which isn't a huge in the comic book world. It is kind of on the indie world, but in the comic book world, that's not a lot. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, can, can you live on ten thousand a month? Uh, you know, and and the thing is, you don't have to make the whole book. Right. You you could start slow and build up to that ten thousand. But if we started slow, mm -hmm. and we're making it as we go, and we start making, and you start seeing movement. Mm -hmm. And you can start, see, and then, then somebody who could be like, "Oh yeah, okay, I'm, 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 I'm all in," mm -hmm. you know. And but I could never get anybody to just start that process with us, you know. Right. Color ink and color a poster. Take right. one of my drawings, ink and color. Let's post it. Let's see if we get movement on it. If we get right. some movement, then let's do a page. We get moving on that, and then let's do a whole, you know, five pages mm -hmm. or seven pages, do a little ash can type of thing. Are we getting movement? Are we starting to get viewers and, and, and page views? And then as it starts going, and I'm streaming, you're streaming, we're all doing a type of streaming, we should get, there should be, we should get some donations as we go. Mm -hmm. Plus, and if we did the subscription thing, mm -hmm. we could be doing it. And then at the end, it's like, here, now we got it done. We could either do one or two things. You subscribe for six months on our channel at five, six bucks a month. You get the book at the end. Right. Or live a little and then we do a kickstart and you get the book or you just get the, you you you've got the digital copy of it because right. you've been watching and and you have access to it it's like i i like one guy's idea of how he did that was if you had a nine dollar or a, his was i think five dollars and if you did it five dollars over four months mm -hmm. or six months you got a book Right. You just automatically he got done and sent you the sixty page that, book. I think that'd be cool. You know, and and so you feel like you're giving you're 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 not not only are you getting access to the stream, mm -hmm. you're getting to watch us create it mm -hmm. and hopefully I mean my my thing all the time is is I ain't the best at doing this, but I know a little bit mm -hmm. and if I can help teach you can help teach me and we could collaborate and school this together well plus i mean there's other things that you know i mean money making things that i thought would be great is i would love to see that shattered time logo mm -hmm. that we have there you know that everybody can see on the screen right there hopefully that would be so cool on a fucking t-shirt oh yeah that on a hoodie oh god that'd be cool mm-hmm I mean, just the just the symbol alone. I mean, but uh, just where it says Shattered Time in the front, and then it has Rasmus and Phillips. Well, what I would do is I'd do Shattered Time on the back like that, mm -hmm. and then on the front of the hoodie. Have the logo. 
Well, I, yeah, I would use the, uh, the the six element logo, mm-hmm. or which would be really cool, I think, because I did it with Lucius on his tunic, mm-hmm. which along the side, so down on the border, I would put them. Oh yeah, that's that'd like be this. Sweet. And so on the shirt, you just do it like that. So you're mimicking Lucius's or down the sleeves. Right. Ooh, that would be cool down the sleeves. Right. But uh. But yeah, I mean. Actually, you know what? And I, I still say this. I think. A, we get get going enough, and once or twice a week, we stream playing Call of Duty. <laughs> we, you laugh, but when we when we played that Unity, mm-hmm. that stupid little mm-hmm. browser game, that right. Unity one. Yeah, I remember. That was fun. I, I watch these guys all the time. Nick Merckx. I watch uh, Isaac Sosa, Jada. I watch all these guys, and it's like the. Nick Merckx especially, his interaction with the guys that he plays with is hilarious. They're 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 just capping on each other and mm-hmm. you know, and it's like we had so much fun mm-hmm. messing with people. Dude, they're right here. They they had to have thought we were hacking at times because we knew exactly where people were. And and I think people are hacking sometimes when I play in it, but I forget that they can be playing it with friends. Right. And over audio, you know, hey, the guy's over here, he's right, turn, red, 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 ready, slide, go, bam, he's up in the corner, bam, you know, mm-hmm. and, but, I, I watch those guys, you watch them the stream, and 20 bucks here, 30 bucks there, 50, oh, 50 yeah. bucks, and right. then I saw them give Nick 200 bucks, what, mm-hmm. and then that guy's so big, you know what they do, guys get into the, into the, to the level, mm-hmm. And they fly a helicopter over to him. They went and collected a bunch of cash, a mm-hmm. bunch of loot. They fly a helicopter, land, get out, and stand. And he walks up, pop, collects all the crap, gets in the helicopter, and takes off and starts doing stuff. He's got <laughs> he's got fan feeding them right. stuff. And it's so, like, oh no, a lot of people probably think that's cheating. Yeah, that's not cheating. <laughs> 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 oh yeah. But the one cool thing they did is they had all 150 people mm-hmm. for the thing. So they got all their fans right. to all descend into the same area. Yeah. So they they said, let us jump out. And then ten, wait five seconds, count one, five Mississippis, and then jump out. So they jumped out, streamed, got, and then looked up and just the sea of just... Just, just, it was crazy. And they, they also went, they went down to like the airport was a big open area, and they had everybody line up two by two, mm-hmm. and just walked like a big old army of guys. It was, mm-hmm. it was kind of cool, but yeah. But no, I mean, um, you know, as far as uh, merchandising and stuff, I mean, we need to. What I, what I really we can do that right now. We don't have to wait. Oh, I know. We but can what be making I, crap. But what I what I was saying is, um, I would love to have something, you know, like a complete first book or something, just something that I can send to somebody who uh, has other channels, you know, like you know, just to get them, you know, reading it and going, oh wow, that's great. So they talk about it on their channel. Well, that the one guy that I was saying that has the success successful Indiegogos with him, mm-hmm. he he showed every now and then he does updates showing. Here are here's here's mine that I've done, but here are the ones I backed, right. and then he does reviews on some of the ones that he's backed, you know, and mm-hmm. it's like those guys, those guys. See, I've watched because that Nick, those guys. Mm-hmm will buy their competitors books and read them right because they're fans they don't look at it and be like i ain't supporting him right it's like he casas who casa right it, it's almost like my dad had this guy jimmy roan that he used to listen to this motivational guy he talks about how this guy sitting in a gold mine mm-hmm. of and, and it's about information but it's gold mine he's, he's over there literally mining gold and you go walking by and he goes, hey, I got a gold mine here. There's more more of it than I can 
that I can have. Mm-hmm. Why don't you come over and get some? <laughs> and he goes, you know what most people yell back? I ain't got a shovel. And he's like, well, maybe you ought to get you one, <laughs> you know? Right. Wouldn't you do everything you could mm-hmm. to get you a shovel right. to go in and get in that mine? And so those that's what some of those guys are. You know, they, 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 they say, yeah, come get, play in the sandbox. Right. There's so many, so much of the establishment people are saying, well, no, yeah. not you, not you, you can't play in our sandbox. And but I think, you know, um, you know, as far as the YouTube community and stuff like that, and the, the podcast community, um, we're in such a niche, because uh, I can't think of, um, I can't think of anybody else that's doing this, that's writing a book right now, or writing a graphic novels series that's got a podcast or anything but um you know well they have i think that they do reviews comic reviews right i think that we're um they do podcasts since since, since we're not r- really threatening their thing you know um you know somebody that reviews video games or reviews this or reviews that i think that um we can easily like send out product to them you know like books or whatever you know to get them interested in us to where we can get other platforms or other people talking about us well, as much as we're talking about them. Cause we, well, I must know. admit, what seems to happen with those other guys that mm-hmm. I've seen mm-hmm. is if we can just grow, right? they will they will come to us. I they know. will come to us. They'll reach out right. to us because that's the way they are. Mm-hmm. And, and I've seen it right. with, with their channels. It's like, it's like their people say, hey, dude, have you seen this? What they're doing over there, oh, so awesome, and, and and then they go look, and 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 they're not what people say they are, right? And and so it, it's out there. We just have to grow. Right. You know, we've we've averaged one viewer this whole time. Well, what's funny is, is um, you know, are you talking about on Twitch? On Twitch, and I know we're on Twitch, but I am in the art section. I was drawing, right? So it wasn't like. But I do know that on Twitch, anime is king. Right. And I'm sorry, I just don't do anime. But uh, it, I think, I think it will come. Hopefully, well, yeah. it'll get bigger. And uh, I'll, I'm gonna try some other platforms too. But I don't know if it'll go on them because they're so much smaller. But, right. but we gotta branch out. We gotta. Right. I have a parlor parlor account, but I haven't started using it. We need to start link, linking all our stuff together. Yeah. Um, you the know, bad part is just sitting down and, and doing and doing all of it because I just it makes my head hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Truthfully, and and, and I and I talked with him. Wasn't was, this where you where you were talking about the shovel? Yeah. I mean, I know it makes your head hurt, but we gotta use our shovel. I know. <laughs> Well, you can pick up shovel too. <laughs> yes. I don't. I'm not the only one that has to do all the linking. You could do some linking. Yeah, I need to. Uh, you have access to all the stuff. Yeah, I just need to. Um, I mean, I need to literally. Go, I, I haven't really gone on Facebook and posted anything. I haven't really I gone haven't on post on Facebook. I mean, and like even on the blog on on our website, you know, you, you can always. Put stuff on there. Um, right. One one thing that I've always said that I think would be a great uh, uh, marketing tool. I hate when you forget words. <laughs> but like like this drawing I just did, right? Right. There is nothing in the books anywhere that that's associated with this drawing. Correct. But that doesn't mean you couldn't sit down and spit out five paragraphs of story, backstory. Well, yeah, like I was already talking about with uh, Jesse, um, you know, I mean, I just actually read it in the book. Mm -hmm. But um, Jesse is an interesting elf all on her own because she grew up um, very well off and she... uh, She was basically a daughter of royalty and um, she uh, traveled the world and... um, they were, they were grooming her to be the emissary between races, mm-hmm. and um, in a lot of ways, uh, she is still playing that role, even though she's not really working for the government. She is a uh, 
she when you enter the uh, where her bar is located and where her house is located is um kind of a crossroads between all the different kingdoms the elven kingdom the dwarven kingdom the goblin kingdom all these different things and so when anybody's traveling to uh, along trade route that's a trade route you know between those different uh, realms she's at that middle point in the trade route um, when people are stopping you know they're stopping there you know so she is kind of an emissary a greeter as people are coming uh, to trade with the elven kingdom so in a lot of ways even though she's not really working for the government um, she is still providing that service you ever seen that musical Oliver Twist mm -hmm. so there's a song in there that the wait that the one lady sings that um pa pa mm -hmm. she's trying to distract what's thing so Oliver can get away and go see the um pa so in my mind I just had this idea you, you had this picture of her like this mm -hmm. with the bar behind it and then this narrative of something like uh, she used to once uh, entertain kings and royalty and, mm -hmm. and blah 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 and all this stuff and, and this grand life and blah blah now now it's 12 hours a day picking up after slobs and picking up cigarette but, uh, cigar butts and and mopping up spilt beer and, but, and but she couldn't be happier well kind of but mm -hmm. yet there's I, I, I just see as a writing you can see this idea that she once had this kind of glamorous life and now she's doing this because why because they've secluded themselves and now that no longer happens mm -hmm. and this is now her life and then at the end of that I could see her like you hear the bar behind it and it gets louder and louder and she looks back looks out looks back throws a scar down and is like <laughs> but well you know go to entertain her right, guests right and and the idea of and this little five little, little bunch of little paragraphs that give you this backstory insight of this little scene mm -hmm. and I thought if if I drew little things like that and you wrote stuff like that and then we just post them on all the different things Instagram Facebooks right all that stuff just and a, people not just have just a hook they don't just have the thing, but they're now they're they're really starting to learn about these characters and all this and and you know you can kind of oh wow that's kind of an interesting character or whatever right. but I don't know that and 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 that story doesn't even have to be yeah like 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 what I I just did an else world idea of it well, the biggest uh, problem what she's not right. The biggest problem I have it because I think that is a fantastic idea. You know, um, the biggest problem I have is um, uh, when I'm not. I have a, two days off a week, sometimes just one, and uh, when I go to work, um, I work such long hours that basically I'm sleeping, then going to work, sleeping, then going to work, sleeping, then going to work. And so I have very little time to type. So, you know, I mean, uh, but I think, you know, that would be great as a Facebook post. Just that picture right there with your, a little blurb. Um, yeah, because um, you don't even have to tell people that, you know, I, I would post that and people, some people wouldn't even know who the hell drew it or who the hell wrote that. You know, but uh, it w hopefully it would be a entertaining enough little paragraph or two that uh, would get people interested of well, what's that from. Right. Well, not <laughs> even just what that's from, but well, hopefully what happens is people look forward to the next one. Right. And then look and then look forward to the next one, and then they start being like, well, what's that from? And then with links, and then they start going, and and then. Because I mean, and then hopefully they're watching these, they're joining in when we do these, right? And they, you know, then they can come and ask us questions, and and we can just chit chat, and it, 
you know, we, we could go hours just talking pop culture and movies and references and stuff like that. And, and you want to come talk about your fi- favorite science fiction stuff, sci-fi fantasy, we'd love to do that. Uh, you know, we'll just get on and I can just draw and we can just chit chat the whole time. And that'd be a fun pot. That, 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 that's what I'm looking for. That's what I want to get to actually. I'd love to get to the point where, yeah, we have some structured things here and there, but I'd love to be able to just almost get on, turn on, and then just interact with our fans. Well, that would be fun, but um, I love the fact that we're not just a podcast that talks about current events. I mean, yes, we do talk about current events, but everything that we've ever talked about so far links back to either our story or stories in general. Mm-hmm. And because that's what I want our podcast to always be about is stories in general. And what's great about that is because to me, the greatest stories out there, you know, um, uh, you know, seem to agree with me politically, you know, philosophically and all that kind of stuff. Because, um, you know, like I've, I've, we've said in the past, I can't think of any story that uh, any great story out there that you know not talking about freedom or something like that some of my favorite stories are you know politically driven stories talking about you know individual freedoms and you know and and uh fighting for that you know our you know fighting for rights and stuff like that those are my favorite stories you know um i can't think of any stories that are good that you know, I don't agree with ph- philosophically. I guess you could you could say, well, that you know kind of supports itself. Or you know, of mm-hmm. course, you're not going to like something that you disagree with uh, politically. But I just can't think of any uh, stories that have won any awards that aren't you know cut from that cloth. You know, I mean, Braveheart. You know, uh, God, y- you name it. There's great stories out there. V for Vendetta is one of my favorite movie, you know, movies. And a lot of people are like, well, you know, that's, you know, that's not talking about freedom. It's like bullshit. That is 100%, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, no, no, he's a terrorist. No, no, he's no. not. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that I love about our podcast is v for we, we have found, we have found a niche that I don't think anybody else has really done. I don't think so. I, I think because of all the different stuff that we do do. Mm-hmm. Um, he said do do. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, but I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I'll just get on and just draw. Right. But I haven't drawn. I haven't just got on and drawn faces yet. I haven't done that in a while. But there's going to be a couple of times when I just sit down and just doodle faces. And I just mm-hmm. want to be able to sit down, doodle faces, and chit chat. You know. Yeah. Uh, I guess I did it one of our podcasts. I just I was going to draw yeah. something, but I ended up just drawing faces. Right. Um, but yeah, we we've, we've done that. But everything that we talk about, I mean, and I guess it's because uh, we're both in agreement. Um, one of the things that I often say to people is um, my favorite thing in life is stories. Well, I mean, I don't think we would. We definitely wouldn't hang out like this if we didn't agree on a lot of stuff. Because, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's a lot of people in the business industry and stuff like that who you know, they don't care. They just, it's just a job. Right. And yeah, eventually it will be just, at times it is just a job, but I want it to be more than just a job. I want it to be, you know, uh, I did that left-handed, so I had to think about it. Uh, <laughs> It needs to be more than just a job. It needs to be. I, I watched. I was telling you, I watched this guy who does RC cars on YouTube. Yeah. And he says, 
you can't just do one or two and think you're going to be successful. I mean, it's it's it has to be a job, man. And and mm -hmm. you have to love running RC cars, right? In order to make it uh, an enjoyable channel, profitable channel, because if if you're not having fun out there doing it, then they're not having fun out there doing it, right? And so maybe maybe that's my problem. Maybe I'm not having fun drawing. Maybe that's the reason why people aren't watching me draw enough. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, um, and I think I, it helps, you know, that there's a, a background to all these yeah, pictures. Yeah. Well, I think it helps, you know, when, when, when nobody's watching, it's like, eh, you don't feel like you're reaching anything and doing any good. It helps when people watch and interact with you, and then all of a sudden you realize, you think, hey, I might actually be getting somewhere. Well, that day will come. Hopefully. I mean, you have to realize uh, we're on a channel that, you know, are on channels where there's billions of other people. Yeah. It's like, how are they supposed to find uh, that one thing? Well, now if you go on the Twitch and you start scrolling down, mm -hmm. like we have one viewer, so... To get down to where the one viewers are, and then how many of those are to, to find our one thing, mm -hmm. that's why we really do have to, it has to build this audience where people want to watch. And and we need to get on a schedule. I mean, I, I got to get mm -hmm. on a schedule. I need to get on. A well, that's another or, problem I have is, uh, you know, this month we were I was lucky enough to get Wednesday Thursdays off. It's Wednesday by the way. Hi. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've been able to do it. We've had two Wednesdays in a row, but um, my schedule changes constantly. Right. Well, it can change, but we have to be able to put it up and say, right. Okay, so next week is schedule change, but we will be. Still doing or it. actually, we could still do it and post it. Mm -hmm. We could always post it on YouTube at the same time. Twitch might be changed up every every couple of weeks or every other month. Mm -hmm. But but if I were to draw every day at the same time, that'd make a big difference too. And mm -hmm. and because people need to be able to be like. Well, I ain't got nothing to do right now. Oh, I know they're over there doing their thing, so I won't go. I'll just go and hang out with them. Right. Uh, it doesn't seem like a lot, but what I've researched with a lot of other successful, uh, with other not a lot of other, like I'm successful, mm -hmm. but with m successful podcasters, is that having that schedule and knowing when it drops is huge. Well, yeah. But they're lucky to have it. They're lucky to have it, and that's that's. Oh gosh, I you know. <laughs> you look at I, 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 I saw an artist set up today mm -hmm. that he uses to capture his live drawing on paper. Hmm. That's been five six hundred bucks, right? Maybe a thousand bucks to do what he did. I ain't got no thousand. I don't even have right. hundred bucks to do that. Right. I had to buy a secondhand microphone that was halfway decent, but our little the the the, the cameras that we're using are little webcams. Mm -hmm. We're sitting in the same room. Right. And that's how bad the cameras are. Oh yeah, I know. <laughs> look at the difference in the picture. We're in the same well, in room. The, in the picture quality, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah no, uh for you for some reason yours is really dark. Yeah, my that camera's always dark. Although it's more saturated with color. Mm -hmm. I can brighten it up, but I have to change the setting every time I open it. Right. It's so annoying. I just would. It'd be nice one day to just have everything we want. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I want. I want everything I want. That would be the best thing in life. Uh, yeah. What we need to do is. We need to set up a studio. We need to have our... You talk about that back end of money. Mm -hmm. You get that development deal. And then we buy like a... Five acre plant, plot of land. Mm -hmm. You can build a house over there. I can build a house over there. 
right? But it's close enough that you could take like a golf cart or something mm -hmm. to the other person's house, or, and and at one of them, or in the middle somewhere, or somewhere on the land, we could build a little studio, a right. tiny like house studio type thing. Or, since I'm a science fiction writer, mm -hmm. and if we really want to make a lot of money, I will become the next L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> <laughs> And we'll create a different form of Scientology. Get your ass on it. And I will invent the stupidest stories as possible that people will buy. You know, if you go just by the movie, but I guess the book's supposed to be pretty good. I never read the book. Have you ever read the You're book? You're talking about Dianetics? Dianetics. You ever read it? No. Uh, I've never read it. I mean, it must be I've pretty decent, I've right? heard from a lot of people, especially on that TV show that I'm watching, that, um, yes, it is a great self-help book. Well, not, oh, well, Dianetics, but what, what's the... Are you talking about, like, the, What's the, the novel that he wrote that explains all the, there's, who they are and what they are and everything? There's about 13,000 different books that he wrote. Some of which, like that battlefield Earth, that Travol battlefield Earth, yeah. What that that's supposed to, whatever that's based on, it's supposed to be pretty good, isn't it? It got, well, I watched Battlefield Earth. Well, no, that was horrible. What I'm saying right. is, the novel that that was based on is supposed to be pretty good. Supposed to be really good, right? Uh, in fact, it was so good that even you know the people that made it were like, oh, "What did we do?" But you the know what I mean. Biggest problem Hubbard had, in my opinion. Is he would, uh, you know, he wrote that Dianetics thing, and it was a self help book, and, you know, he wanted to help all these people. And so then he thought he would sell his idea to psychiatrists. And when all the psychiatrists read the book, and, and he said that, well, this can help, you know, blah, 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 with this and that and that, and all the claims he made, all the psychiatrists in the world said, you're a quack. <laughs> and um, he, uh, got you know his biggest problem is he's an angry person and so then he started writing all these rules in Scientology about you know um, that psychiatry and psychology is a joke mm. um, and that uh, you know and, and that psychiatrists should be avoided and all this kind of stuff and that's one of the reasons why you know when Tom Cruise gave that one interview about uh, can't remember her name. Uh, one of the one actress was talking about um, uh, using antidepressants and stuff, and uh, they asked his opinion on it, and he's like, "Well, psychology is a pseudoscience." Mm. And that's a fam famous quote of his, and that's where he learned it was. So, you know, Scientology hates, not dislikes, hates psychiatry. Hmm. What's that? I'm just a Pinterest. Up. We found some fresh boards for you. <laughs> Sorry, now, I couldn't find my boards on Pinterest. Mm -hmm. So I thought maybe downloading the app for the desktop, that I'd be able to find them better. Mm -hmm. Now I get that stupid sign. It's got to get rid of that. <laughs> I finally figured out how to find them. <coughs> Because uh, you can save boards, you can follow boards, mm -hmm. and so I have a co have a lot of my references stored there. Right, and it's like it used to be click on following, and then it was people boards. Huh, there they are. Now it's I have to click. Uh, <laughs> it's so frustrating. <laughs> it takes me a it takes me a while to find them again. Right. Every time I go to try to, so so frustrating. But that would be cool. I have a little studio set up like that, mm -hmm. where we could have. This, I don't know how to set it up right, but you could set it up to where we could just boom, start podcasting. Right. I don't know if we'd be set on you know you on one side, me on the other side, and then and then that it, you could just boom, done pocket. Play a little game, do a little work, stream. Right. But it's like. Takes money. Yeah, it takes money. Why, why does everything cost so much? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Why can't this all be free? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's going to make me start talking about politics. I don't want to do that. <laughs> yep. But, well, she's, that girl's willing to, to do some work, you know. The, the toughest part that we've always found, that had found is, 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 you know, everybody wants to get paid. Well, um, the good news is, is Braley's young. Well, that, that's good and bad. Right. It all depends on how, how active her social life is. Right. How active her social life is and how, how important working for money is. Because, yep. I mean, if all that stuff outweighs, because it takes time, you know, they, they say if you want to be a successful artist like this, you kind of have to give up friends. Uh, your butt's in a seat drawn for 10 hours a day. Because mm -hmm. when I was doing those pages and I'm doing them, it was at least 8, 10 hours a day, uh, almost straight, just mm -hmm. drawing, to try to keep up with a decent pace. And even then I was slower. Mm -hmm. And what I would like to do is I want to work with somebody who I can draw looser. Right. And they can tighten some stuff up that needs to be tightened. Yeah, you talked about that last podcast. Um, so, because uh, if I have to draw it super tight, then it just takes so much more time. And... I think that's, uh, that comes with uh, somebody that you've worked with for a while. It would have, yeah. Cause, um, they learn your shorthand. But even still, I, I, I'm not talking about so loose that it's like, here's a bunch of squiggly lines. Turn all that all that uh, lace down there into uh, lacy frills. What are the, I don't know, lots right. of stuff on that. I would go back and put all that laced, but I wouldn't have to draw everyone just perfect, shade it all, so it's all, you know, but I, if I just, if I put it all in just right, you know, and, mm -hmm. I, but I wouldn't have to be so damn tight. Right. And, and, and the problem though with that though is I also need somebody who can, who can figure out how to express those lines mm -hmm. without losing all the character to the drawing. Right. You, you see some comic books and you're like, wow, that's the shittiest looking art I've ever seen. And then you go and you see the pencils mm -hmm. before they were inked. And you're like, oh, wow. That's really good stuff. And then you see what the inker did to their lines, and you're like, oh. <laughs> like, <laughs> left out half of them. Right. And then just, like, heavily blocks. It's just, you need somebody. You don't want somebody just to trace it. Trace it. But you want somebody to who has some expression to their lines, because right. Well, and that's what Dirt was talking about, right? That guy, he was talking about uh, bypassing the inking stage, go straight to coloring, but putting ink over the top when needed to separate things and right. to embellish, right. and that would be probably ideal. You know. Uh, doesn't need to be just hard inked. Right. Although hard ink usually saves you with coloring. Because you just black out a bunch of stuff and then the coloring comes easier. But no, just, you know, if she has good color theory, color theory makes We won't, we so won't much. know until you see it. Okay. Yeah. I so, can, yeah. And I can help. I can work. I mean, I can. I can color technically right it's very hard for me that's what I told her and it, <laughs> it takes a long time for me to do it and usually the long, the worst part is is I get everything I do ends up coming very painted looking it, it's like it, I can't just do simple right I don't know why it drives me nuts <laughs> And I tried doing simple coloring, and it just it doesn't look right. I don't know. Because if I, I, I would love to be able to just splash some color on some stuff, 
easy like some of these guys do. And it's like, da -da -da, I did that with uh, the mech driver one on here. Mm -hmm. And even that started getting too intense. But that was a great picture. Mm -hmm. This one's a great picture. This one with just a, mm -hmm. some color on it. And, and I could, you could color her mm -hmm. pretty good. And then we could, I could just block in the guy, people in the background. Mm -hmm. Just enough that you know, oh, those are people. Mm -hmm. Drinking and celebrating and do whatever. And you wouldn't even have to see major details, but you just know that that's what's happening in the background. That'd be a great illustration. It'd be a great picture. Mm -hmm. Yep. So. I agree. That's a nasty tangent, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> this right here, so doesn't that look like her hand? Nah, I didn't think it was her hand. Uh, see, that's what my brain does. It makes me think it's her hand instead of the frill. Maybe like her pinky mm -hmm. resting. Yeah. It turned out a little bit better than I thought it would. <laughs> it took me a minute to get something right. that looked right but yep that works I like it character bios and the other thing is I need to be drawn more that I'll finish stuff because my thing right now is I'm having a hard time now going back and making all that lace mm -hmm. do something make it actually come a lot you know I don't want to do it. Hmm. I need to, but I don't want to. Yeah. And uh, so, if she does want to work, does want to really jump in and, and go at it, uh, might be a nice kit to help mm -hmm. with some great motivation. Right. I really want to try those new pages the way that I have them laid out because mm -hmm. I think the mech fight mm -hmm. and then the elemental knights fight will get kicked up huge with some of the ideas that I had for it mm -hmm. uh, I was listening to one guy talking <laughs> I kind of just he kept on talking about it's a comic book there should be comic book stuff in it and I was like Oh, yeah. You know, because sometimes people always comment, and I take it as a compliment. They say, it feels like I'm watching a movie. I'm reading a movie. Right. And it looks so cinematic. And I'm like, thank you. I tried to make it cinematic. But sometimes, sometimes it's a comic book. And sometimes it just needs to be comic book -y at times, I think. Maybe not. I don't know. I, I like the cinematic. I, you like the cinematic? Mm -hmm. I know you like the cinematic, but once again, how many comp, how many books do you buy a year? Comics? Me? Yeah. Hardly any. Right. You know, I mean. I mean, don't get me wrong. I will read stuff. Right. But for me to actually shell out the money. See, that's the problem. See, that's what I'm saying. Is It seems like the people that always say they like the cinematic look. Mm hmm aren't the ones that buy shit. And Maybe. so, but the people that say they love the comic book stuff, because that's what they're reading it for. Right. They're reading it for those comic book things that you just don't get in movies. Right. Wow. Uh, and it's like, I can do some of that. There's some stuff that I've been missing, you know, that I can just, just, let me just, let me punch it up. And, and all of a sudden, when I started thinking that way, Mm -hmm. those fight scenes start evolving and really getting more elaborate and getting really cool. So, yeah. Uh, but it's still cinematic. Because, <laughs> I mean, um, it's cool cinema. Yeah, it's like Matrix. Right. Which, let's be honest, The Matrix was a comic book first. Right. Which is, which, yeah, I mean, they tried making anime a com or manga mm -hmm. into a movie. And they did it. And they did it. Very successfully. So that's, you know, that's kind of my mindset with this. Is 
you know, with that is I want it to be like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes I get too drawn into the cinematic part of it of just the pacing and stuff. And sometimes it's like, you know what? It just needs to be a pose mm -hmm. with some exciting stuff happening and because mm -hmm. it's a freaking comic book, you know what I mean? Right. Because, well, damn it, sometimes you just want that. Instead of like, well, they should be just talking over here and doing this. It's like, no, maybe they should be wah, talking or something. You know? But So... Well, anyway, and that's what I've been trying to do. All right. I think we've killed enough time. Um, next time, uh, you know, I, I would uh, still like to, you know, continue reading. Um, uh, the problem is, is if um, anything happens between this week and next week, um, we, uh, you know, if there's something really cool to talk about, you know, we end up talking about it. Um, so yeah, we might need to do another, uh, uh, comic, you know, other movie thing. I don't know. That one did pretty good, mm -hmm. that podcast. So maybe, uh, some, maybe we'll talk about sci-fi movies or fantasy movie or, mm -hmm. or comics right. or something, you know, I don't know. Maybe we ought to, and that way and tie it all back to Shattered Time. Yeah, we could, we could, that's easy enough to do, because that always happens, but right. <laughs> shout out time or anything that we're working on, mm -hmm. but what I mean though is, is maybe we ought to do another one of those theme things, like the, when we did our favorites, right? but maybe we ought to, I know you like Tarantino. Who doesn't? I think, that, <laughs> but if, you know, what might be interesting is the... Because I haven't seen everything. Well, maybe I have. I think I have. It's been a long time since I've seen some stuff, but it might be interesting to rank our Tarantino Tarantino movies. Oh, jeez. I mean, there's only, what, eight, right? Right. But it'd be, or nine now, I guess, with uh, Hollywood. Right. I haven't seen that one, though, yet. It's okay. Is it? Yeah. It's, it's funny, you know, because I'm... Um, most movies that Tarantino does kind of has a formula, you know. I mean, the whole everybody dies aspect, you know, type of thing. And, um, you know, that's one of the reasons that I, I, I love The Hateful Eight, because uh, it, it followed that same formula. Everybody dies, pretty much. And, um, uh, and you know, that's, that's, that's fun and everything. But um, that Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, it's... I guess the thing I didn't like about it most is it didn't follow Tarantino's formulas. Mm. It was uh, completely... Was the banter there, though? Oh, yeah. The banter was there. The, the conversations and all that kind of stuff, that stuff was there. But, I mean, um, it... I don't know. It just uh, it didn't feel as much like a Tarantino flick. I like, I like this one show that I was watching, Screen Junkies. Well, no. This new this new show that uh, Popcorn Planet I haven't watched it in a long time, but he had a game on there, and it was he had to take he took two movies. Mm -hmm. It was on screen, right? uh, but he took two movies, and you had to argue for one of the movies. Mm -hmm. So he pop up the 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 movie. So like yeah like uh, okay so. Where does Indiana Jones, the first one, set in your pantheon? Is it high? Um, I'd say... Uh, I well, mean, pick two of your favorite films that are cross-genre, that are opposite. So, Well, two of my favorite films. I mean, honestly, I, I like uh, Braveheart and Braveheart. Forrest Gump. Okay, Braveheart, Forrest Gump. <laughs> Which one do you want to argue for, Braveheart or Forrest Gump? Pick Forrest. one. Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump. Okay. One of them has to no longer exist. You're now... <laughs> you're... <laughs> you're pro-Gump. Right. And I'm pro-Braveheart. And now we argue which one gets the... Which one... Which one gets zapped out of existence? 
Please don't make me do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great game because because no. because you they always pick they they always they they don't know which way he's going to go with it. Because I I, 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 I I wouldn't want either one of those to be zapped out of existence. Because he, he it's not always zapped out of existence. It's other things, too. Like, right. he plays around with it. So, so sometimes they'll they'll think, oh, okay, he's zapped out. Oh, I want I, I want to argue Braveheart. So they'll pick it, and then he changes up the format. And they're like, no! <laughs> it's always something like that. It's, it's a great game. Damn. Sounds like an emotional roller coaster. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or they, or they even do stupid things like, uh, like, just think of two stupid movies on which right. you have to argue, which one gets the, you know, but that's which, which is the better film, and you're like, I don't want to argue for either of them. They're so stupid. Well, but that's another thing with with me, uh, with me. Um, you know, like I was saying, you know, I love stories. You know, that's one of my favorite things in life, and. uh I get emotionally attached to all this shit. We should talk. We need to co- talk comics. I mean, I know we yeah. have, right? But I think we, 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 you know, I got my two boxes here and some oh, more. But yeah, I've lost all mine. But we should talk mm-hmm. stories and things that shaped our our experience and what what it was about comics that yeah that that, that I remember. Um, I was in high school. When the whole Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle thing originated. Me too. I was in I was in I was in high school and I was in Driver's Ed. Mm-hmm. And a friend of mine told me he brought the graphic novel to TNT. school. TNT, yeah. TNT, yeah. And he let me read it, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, I have to have one of those." That was the most amazing thing. Mm-hmm. I went and got it. Mine now is a first printing, which is worth a lot mm-hmm. the only problem is I read it so much the cover's falling off right. it's worth nothing right. because I read it so much but it's like I remember that book kind of, and, and I maybe we should save it for that but yeah, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, yeah l- 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 you know what let's talk comic books next week yeah. next time let's talk let's talk our love of comics and what right where it all started and I can still I mean it doesn't take long to read a chapter. I can still read a chapter, and we can still just jump into that. Okay. Yeah. All right. And that way, we uh, please everybody. <laughs> See you later, Brett. Yeah. See you later. Uh, Thanks for hanging out. Uh, uh, Burnoutstudios.com. Um, you know, subscribe, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Smash the like button. You know, whatever they say in this in this world. I wanna. And. Um, I want to make this really big. And we want to put that logo on a t-shirt. It would look so cool. This, and I want to do... Why is it that moving? That's not supposed to move. I want this one to move. Right. Why isn't it moving? Don't know. It's on a different That's, layer. There is that it is. the one I want to move? Hmm. Okay, and then I'm going to screenshot that. So that I can make a thumbnail out of that for the podcast. Yeah. Thanks a lot for hanging out. Appreciate it. See you next time. See you next week. Like, subscribe, smash. I like this.